Um, we are so thankful for you to come along and give us your time. And uh, Dr. Alex Doyle, please work away. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Nicola. Um, so I hope that what I'm going to talk to you about this evening is going to be useful to you. I believe a recording of this talk is going to be available to you, uh, probably on YouTube. And um, by all means, I'm happy to answer questions at the end. Um, they have to be quite general. Obviously, I can't really make comment on individual circumstances because I don't know you or your son or your daughter. So uh, without further ado... I can hope to move my slides on, yes. So what I'm going to start with, I'm going to give you a few statistics and then I'm going to move into uh, really what are the essential skills for managing college. Uh, some information on what you can expect in terms of, uh, 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 in terms of registering with college disability services, what, what you might expect to happen. Uh, and then understanding how a college actually works. So just a quick word about the Disability Access Route to Education uh, 2023. Uh, as an applicant, you and a successful applicant, you have access to orientation programmes. Some of these will have taken place last week in some colleges. For example, in Trinity College, they took place today and tomorrow and on Friday. You also have access to learning support, assistive technology, library supports, exam accommodations, possibly an educational support worker if necessary, and academic tuition. And just to, uh, to let you know that in the DARE scheme this year, there were almost 10,000 uh, applicants and about 9,000 applicants to the HEAR scheme as well. Just a few statistics for you. So you can see here on the screen, uh, these, are take, these figures are taken from uh, AHEAD, the Association for Higher Education Access and Disability. They do uh, a report every year on uh, access to higher education. Um, so there are about 16,000 uh, applicants and undergraduate students with disabilities in 2020, 2021, and that represented about 7.8% of uh, total undergraduate population. And this has been a big increase, an 11% increase on the previous year. As you can see on that pie chart, students with ADHD represent about 5.5% of the population of students with disabilities who are registered with disability services. And if we look at this data on the right hand side here in the uh, third column with the colored shading, uh, these are the percentage of students with ADHD in terms of the field or the category in which they're studying. And as you can see, mostly 25%, a study in arts and humanities, uh, of those about 17% study in business administration and law. So there's a, an obvious slant towards arts courses. So I'm moving on now to essential skills for successful transition to college. And this is really built on years of uh, our experience in disability services in third level education. So it's about building your personal skills, uh, developing academic skills, using technologies and supports effectively, learning to be independent and managing this transition bridge right now uh, that you're, you're going through this uh, transition from school into post-school destinations. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about what that actually means. In terms of uh, building personal skills, Really, the essential things are self-awareness, self-determination, and self-advocacy. And having those attributes gives you great confidence. So that means seeking support if needed, being motivated, developing academic skills, and, or being aware that you need to develop them, um, managing your time, being organized, uh, being responsible, Adhering to college rules or work rules if you also on a part time course or you've got uh, um, placement uh, as part of your course and having proficient IT skills. And that's really important. IT skills are not the same as the computer skills that you might have uh, in terms of gaming. Uh, it's, it's really important to get to grips with particular software packages. So a little bit more information on that. 
Office 365 is generally speaking, all students are given access to an Office 365 suite of applications as part of their student profile, as, start, as part of what college gives to students to enable them to complete their work. It's really important that you might be used to using Google Drive, you might habitually use Google Docs. They're not fantastically compatible with some of the Microsoft suite of products. So we would advise that you actually buy into using the software packages that you've been given because all of these tools, all of these applications are really integrated with each other. Um, if you're not confident about your skills in terms of uh, using all the different applications within Office 365, you can, for example, access uh, LinkedIn. Uh, they have online training courses, for example, PowerPoint, using Outlook correctly, uh, time management, uh, Excel spreadsheets, for example. So definitely access all of the free training courses that are, are available to you. Another part of uh, effective personal skills and using technology correctly are communication etiquette. This is really important in third level when you are communicating with administration, with departments and schools, with individual professors. NUI Galway have this really useful document uh, and advice and a guide to emailing staff, which I would recommend that you download and, and read. Uh, how to write effective emails, reviewing them before sending, making sure you check your grammar and spelling. Uh, do you actually need to ask this question or can you find out the information elsewhere on the college website? And just that general etiquette over, you know, dear Professor Smith, rather than, hey, um, that goes a long way to setting the tone of your communication with people in college. In terms of uh, sensory, getting to know the environment. Um, obviously, the environment is going to be new to you. Uh, the campus could be very big. It take a little bit of time to get to know different areas. But you need to, as part of your self-awareness and self-determination, you need to know yourself. What are your sensory preferences? What kind of environment do you work best in? Occupational therapists can help you with this. Find out if your college offers this service. Be aware of your environment. Where do you favor working? So you can discover this over the course of your first term or semester as it's known. What kind of sensory stimuli are there in this environment in terms of noise, in terms of lighting? So really part of your task in this first semester is to find and create spaces that suit your sensory needs. Be very conscious of what you're doing and the activities that you're doing, but also to schedule in some sensory time for yourself. So you may need a movement break. You need may need to get outside into nature, take a walk or some other kind of exercise. This, so this is all part of building your personal skills. The next skill that you need is uh, really academic skills. It's very important that you're very cognizant of developing these skills because the kind of tasks you're required to do are quite different to those in secondary school. So this is concerned with learning how to study effectively, organizing your study environment and managing your time. So for example, whether you're going into further study in further education or higher education, whether you're going to vocational training, uh, whether you are going to be spending some time, as I said, on placement in a workplace environment, you need to understand exactly what and how you will be learning you need to be confident about working independently. You won't have access so readily to teachers in the same way that you would have been used to in school. Uh, you need to decide what you're going to study and when you're going to study it, where to locate this information, uh, what documents you might need, what tools you might need. So basically, you need to know where to find stuff. So how do you do that in third level education? 
Well, all of the uh, third level colleges and further education as well have a platform on which your uh, curriculum materials are stored. So, for example, a UCD uh, have a, a space called Brightspace in Trinity. It's called Blackboard. Uh, in other universities, it might be Canvas, and in some universities and in further education colleges, generally, it's called Moodle. So one of your first tasks in this period when you have received your login details as a student is to explore the learning space that is provided by your college and really get to know it before um, teaching begins. It's also really important at this stage to dig down deep into your course. You may well have read the prospectus when you were uh, applying through the CAO, but now is the time to go into that platform, Moodle or Blackboard or Canvas or Brightspace, find each of your modules and really dig down and see what is inside them. So for example, how many hours in this semester are you going to be spending on lectures? or practical sessions? How many hours are you expected to do in independent study? Um, what kind of percentage is attributed to the different types of learning and assessment? And what is the pass mark? These are things that you need to be aware of before your course actually begins. So there are different ways of, of doing this. So that was an example from UCD. Uh, this is another example from another college. So again, you can see uh, there's information there on how long it takes, whether you're going to be studying abroad. Uh, at the bottom there, there are all the different modules, how many credits there were, and that kind of thing. It's re also really important to look at the teaching and learning methods, how you're going to be assessed. Importantly, we don't want this to happen, but if you have to repeat something, what are your options? And then to find your timetable. It's also possible, uh, there's an example here from TU Dublin, to download a complete handbook for your course. Here, as an example, we have the uh, Bachelor of Arts in Early Childhood Education. They have a number of different handbooks there that students can download. Uh, this one, for example, for this course is about 130 pages long. So plenty of information to read so that you are fully informed about exactly what you're going to learn, but importantly, about the learning outcomes, because those are what you will be examined on. Using human and technological supports. Um, you may have had access to human supports and resources in school you may have had access to learning technologies. So in terms of moving into third level education, you need to reflect on what supports do I have? How do they help me? Will they actually be useful at college or not? Do they then need to be changed or upgraded? How exactly can the technology help me and who is going to provide it? very important questions that you need to be thinking about before teaching begins. So for example, just to give you a few ideas about technology, uh, you may feel that something like a LiveScribe pen would be very useful to you. Um, now this pen on the screen is quite a fat one and they, they've really moved on and now they are really much more like regular pens. But as you can see there in the middle, you use these with digital note paper. It looks exactly like any other ring bound notepad. But the beauty of this is that whilst you're writing with the pen, the pen is actually recording the lecture. When you come to read back through your notes in this notebook and you come to a place where perhaps you don't understand what you've written or what, why it, you've written it or what it meant, if you tap that place in the notebook, it will take you to that exact place in the recording. So something that might be very useful to you across your three or four year college career. Another useful app is Notability. Um, that uh, can be used with um, a laptop computer, but it's very useful to use with an iPad or a tablet. Uh, it also will record whilst you're taking notes, either with a stylus or by typing. You can insert diagrams and, as I said, recordings. 
as I said at the beginning, it's really important to get to grips with the, uh, the apps that you're going to be using in college. For example, uh, in Microsoft Word, there is a dictate function. So you can uh, dictate directly into Microsoft Word. It's very useful. There's also a read aloud function. So you can have any Word document provided by your course read aloud to you. I like to tell students that sometimes that is really useful if it's lecture notes, for example, by listening to notes whilst you're doing something else, perhaps making yourself something to eat means that you're becoming really familiar with the content before you sit down to read that document. Uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, the Association for Higher Education Access and Disability have this fabulous repository called the AT Hive. You can answer three questions to determine what kind of assistive technology uh, would be useful for you. But then on the right hand side there, there are 12 different AT sections which have recommendations for technology for either recording, communicating, taking notes, for example, or reading. So I'd strongly suggest that you um, visit that website and take a look at what they have to offer. In terms of learning to be independent, this is probably one of the, the, the biggest challenges that you might have. Uh, you're very closely supported in uh, school, um, not quite so much when you go to college. And it's about, especially if you are moving away from home, managing daily life tasks, money and housing, health and social relationships, as well as independent learning. So it's important to recognize that even simple activities like making sure you eat properly, managing your laundry, these kind of tasks contribute significantly to your overall sense of well-being. And uh, neglecting them might contribute uh, to additional pressure. So establishing a good routine is very important. Another thing you can do is uh, maybe go onto YouTube and type in uh, first year or dear first year me or first year and the name of your university. There's a lot of videos out there connected to different universities. So you can see on the screen here, one for University of Limerick, one for UCD, one for Trinity at the top, which happens to be one of my favorites because uh, those are students that I would have known. And they're very informative, uh, they're very entertaining, they're very useful. So that's a really simple uh, strategy that you can use. Managing this transition bridge is the, is the final essential skill that you need. So it's about this period of preparing for further study, but also monitoring your first few weeks of being in college. So what does that entail? It entails really being uh, aware of the differences between uh, the institution you've come from and the institution you're going into now and preparing for those changes. Also being aware of what your support you're entitled to receive, thinking about uh, disclosure because you will be disclosing ADHD if you register with support services, making sure that you engage in finding out activities, being proactive to find things out, organizing your supports straight away, making sure you attend any orientation. And there's a lot really to get to grips with in these first couple of weeks. You will have orientation for disability supports, for your course, for your school or your faculty. So there's quite a lot to attend. So you definitely need to be organized. And then, as I say, monitor the first few weeks, take a note of what you might be finding difficult or other questions that need to be answered. So a lot of the institutions have these really useful guides about what you need to do. So on the left there, for example, there's one uh, available from Trinity College on their student life page, you know, accept your offer, check out the orientation, follow Trinity on social media so you know what's going on, apply for accommodation, check your course page, log into your account, register, etc. On the right hand side there at TU Dublin has something very similar. Uh, there is the first year full-time students orientation. 
So it tells you exactly what's going on, on what day and at what time. And this now is your responsibility to make sure that you're fully aware of what's going on and what you need to attend. Other colleges also have on-campus orientation. Uh, it's really important that you do attend. You may not think uh, that it's useful, but it's an opportunity to meet other people on your course, have a campus tour, get to know the library. Um, there are some uh, parts of orientation that might be compulsory depending on your course, especially if it's a professional course. You get an opportunity to meet officers of the Students' Union and learn about clubs and societies. Again, some universities have a virtual tour. Again, at the top there, uh, things that they feel are very important for you to do, things to do before you arrive, things that you need to set up and uh, supports and resources that you need to access. So a lot of work goes in uh, by all of the different colleges to making sure that you have this information available to you. So it's your job to check it out. So that's my summary really of the essential skills that you know, we feel that students really need as they're transitioning into college. And I want to talk a little bit about registering with college disability services. Registering for support with the disability service obviously requires that you disclose that you are a student with ADHD and you may also have other disabilities as well that you want to talk about. So again, this is a guide for, from AHEAD. Uh, it's really useful, it's free to download. And that covers uh, why you might need to disclose, how that might benefit you, uh, when is a good time to disclose, who you should disclose to, and actually how to do it. College supports, uh, there are a multitude of them. As you can see here, there is, for example, the disability service, uh, occupational therapy support, you as parents and guardians, counselling services, college health, academic staff, the students' union, and all colleges have some form of peer mentorship. So first of all, let's talk about academic staff and something called personal tutors. Not all colleges have personal tutors. Um, at Royal College of Surgeons, Trinity, and UI Galway, Marino, for example, do. These would be uh, a member of academic staff that you are assigned to during your college career. Now, personal tutor does not mean they give you private lessons in your course. They are there to look after your pastoral welfare. Other colleges might have a similar support, perhaps uh, they're called academic advisors, for example. They provide a support, offer a listening ear, and they encourage you to think about your academic journey. So really your first task is to ask about the availability of this kind of academic and pastoral support. Uh, who are the key go-to people that you should be communicating with? Health and counselling services, all colleges and IOTs provide a counselling service uh, in some shape or format. You can read more about it at this web link at spunout.ie. This is a free and confidential service to any student who is in difficulty uh, or ha who has issues that they need to discuss. Almost all colleges and provide a health centre, generally speaking, uh, charges are either free or greatly reduced depending on the service that's needed. So your second task is to identify whether there is a counselling and health centre in your college, uh, their contact details, whereabouts they are on campus, what is the appointment schedule and waiting list like, and how much it costs. Occupational therapy support is an extremely valuable support to, to access. It's confidential, it's practical. Uh, it can really help students with ADHD, especially in terms of time management, planning, organization, and work-life balance. Currently, there are teams of occupational therapists in Trinity, UCD, TU Dublin, 
Dublin City University, UCC, NUI Galway, and Marino Institute of Education. The link there on screen is to access, this is a really useful booklet about occupational therapy in higher education. And each of those institutions has written uh, a small summary of the kind of supports that they provide. And I certainly suggest that you access that. So your third task is to make inquiries and ascertain whether OT support is available through the disability service in your college. Student to student supports are very important. As I said, the student union has offices for who are responsible for disability, for student welfare and for education. All colleges and IOTs have a student to student peer mentoring service, um, which is a, a really useful, um, I suppose, entity whereby you can ask other students who, who may possibly have studied in the same area as yourself, questions about you know, how college works, et cetera. You also have in some uh, circumstances of the availability of chaplaincy, for example. So task four really is to identify student to student support systems, how these operate on campus, what are the names of the uh, student union offices responsible for each of those areas, and where is their office on campus? Parents and guardians, of course, are extremely important. It's really important that you uh, understand that with the exception of emergencies, college staff generally do not communicate directly with parents. Uh, students aged 18 years or over are considered to be adults and responsible for their own learning. So if you are concerned about your student, make sure you have a regular catch up or a regular check in with them. How are things going? Uh, everything going OK? Any difficulties this week, for example? It's not a good idea to take over their email account and write emails uh, as if you are the student. And it's not recommended that you telephone college staff and ask that your conversation about your son or daughter remains confidential. It's very problematic then if a student hasn't uh, agreed to that level of confidentiality or sharing it becomes a very difficult situation because you get a triangulation of circumstances where not everybody knows what the other person is saying. So your other task is to talk to your student regularly and continuously point them towards supports in college if they are having some difficulties. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that that's happening. You know what, I think they have a support service or somebody you can talk to about that. So the disability service, will they know that your student or you as a student are coming to college? If you are a DARE applicant, yes, definitely. If you indicated a disability on the CAO but didn't proceed with a DARE application, not necessarily. And obviously, if you didn't indicate a disability, uh, they won't be aware. It's very, very important that you register with the disability service as soon as possible during this period before teaching has begun because the time is needed to access supports, to sort out your exam requirements and to let academic staff know. Now exam requirements are very important. Some exams in some colleges come up quite quickly, especially during this first term. And the exams office understandably has finite deadlines by which after which they won't accept any more students for exam accommodations. For example, in Trinity, we have over 2000 students registered with the disability service. It becomes quite complicated to put in individual exam supports and last minute, after the deadline, therefore cannot be accommodated. So be aware of that. So task six is for you to contact the disability service and arrange to register with them before teaching begins in college. And I can't stress that enough. So what happens when you do contact the disability service? You are given an appointment for a needs assessment. 
in that needs assessment, you discuss the level of disclosure uh, that you feel happy uh, or uncomfortable with in terms of uh, communicating your needs to academic staff. It sets out any reasonable accommodations, which is what we call them in third level, such as human supports, physical accessibility, alternative format of, of materials, for example. As I said, it's about uh, arranging your exam accommodations, providing you with assistive technology solutions if needed, and accessing learning support. So task seven, contact the disability service and ask for a needs assessment appointment. So who decides on those supports? You'll meet with a disability officer or disability advisor. It takes uh, approximately an hour. It might take only 30 minutes. That's entirely dependent on the level of support that you need. The conversation will generally follow um, your strengths, your challenges, or your understanding of your course requirements, what your workload might be. That's very important. So for example, as an art student, you might only have perhaps 14, 20 hours uh, of lectures and seminars and tutorials a week with quite uh, a chunk of spare time that you can spend in the library or are doing autonomous learning. If you are a science or health sciences student, your timetable tends to be quite heavy. You could be in four days a week with lectures from nine till five. So it's really important that you understand your own workload and what your course requirements are. So at the end of that uh, needs assessment, uh, something similar to this document on the left will be generated. So it just has, uh, it's done not based on all of the disability documentation that you have provided. That is not shared with academic staff. They All they have is a summary here, uh, which sets out what you want to disclose, uh, the supports that you require and the exam accommodations that you require. It's fluid and adaptable in that we recognize that your needs will change over the course of your college career. So this can be revisited as often as you wish. Uh, generally, you're given a copy of this document and you are free to distribute that uh, to any member of academic staff that you, you feel needs to read it. So task eight is to uh, agree who will attend the needs assessment and arrange this with the disability service. 99% of students come to a needs assessment uh, by themselves. If you feel quite strongly that you would like a parent to attend, you need to have a conversation uh, with this and um, make sure that you give permission uh, in arrangement with the disability service. So what possible supports does that mean? Well, I've mentioned quite a few of them, um, perhaps accessible locations, the recording of lectures, um, enlarged handouts, some students require lecture notes in advance, possibly flexibility on deadlines, and definitely in most cases, exam accommodations. But task nine really is for you to think about the supports you're going to need as they relate to your course, because the support you had in school may not be relevant to what you are doing now in third level education. So this is something else that you need to reflect on over the next week or so. So here's a summary of those tasks that I identified. Ask about academic and pastoral support, investigate health and counseling, ask about specialized supports, for example, occupational therapy, identify what student to student supports are available. As parents, talk to your student regularly, point them towards support in college, contact the disability service and register, make sure you have a needs assessment and think about the supports you need as they relate to your course. So finally, we're just moving into understanding a little bit about how college works. It is of course, a larger and unfamiliar environment. Uh, importantly, attendance in most courses, but not all uh, is not necessarily compulsory. Uh, by the same token, there are some courses that take attendance, and this is something else that you need to be aware of and you need to check. Obviously, you're engaging with large groups of strangers, 
Uh, as opposed to school rules, there are kind of norms rather than rules. Vastly different teaching methods. You generally speaking don't get a, a practice run at exams. There isn't a really consolidated daily routine. Uh, you will probably find that even timetables change continuously in terms of room changes or changing from one week to the next. Everything you do is principally student driven. So it's up to you, the student, to be proactive in asking questions, for example. It's possible in large courses with large lecture halls, you might be in a lecture theatre with 200 other students. You might never get to know that uh, a lecturer particularly well. Lots of extracurricular options, especially in Freshers Week. Uh, there's a limited amount of handholding. And by that, I mean, nobody's going to check in with you and say, oh, you haven't handed in your assignments. If you didn't hand it in, that's pretty much up to you. And there are aspects of online learning uh, in some courses that might be quite different. It's also important that you get to know some of the jargon that we use in third level. Um, most of the colleges have a, a kind of jargon buster uh, part of their website. Uh, this example on screen is from UCD. So you need to understand the difference between, um, you know, a, a tutorial and a seminar, for example. Uh, what does socks mean? What's ENTS? Um, reading lists, what does that mean exactly? So being familiar with all of this terminology will help you greatly in understanding what kind of expectations college has of you. Uh, I think I've been through Blackboard. Um, you, as I said earlier, you just need to check what platform uh, is used in your college. And as soon as you have your login details, you need to access it and uh, explore what's on there. So for example, I'm giving you an, an example from Trinity. So you have student help pages, you have online assessment guides, frequently asked questions. Um, this turn it in is very important because it's a plagiarism checker. So what that means is when you uh, generally submit your assignment online, you upload it to whichever learning platform your college is using, it will automatically go through a, a Turnitin, which will identify matches to what you've written out there on the World Wide Web. So this is, you should need to be aware of copying and pasting is considered to be plagiarism. You need to understand the difference in terms of academic writing. And that's why engaging with academic support and student learning is very important. What does college expect students to do? Five really important things. Go to a registration and needs assessment. Check your email account regularly. And this is something which can be quite difficult to get to groups with because you will be bombarded by emails from uh, academic staff, from admin staff, student services, the students union. It's quite difficult to get to grips with it. So you need to get into the habit of either making folders within your email and um, really making sure that you siphon things off into those folders and making sure that you star important emails. Whilst learning materials might be on your learning platform, you might get last minute changes to lectures or assignments through your email and you really don't want to miss those. Importantly, you need to let us know if you change your course or if your circumstances change. We aren't automatically alerted if you've moved from business studies to film studies. So if we're sending out information to one course and actually you've changed to another course, that's not useful to anybody. Uh, if you've decided ultimately that you are going to uh, defer your place, we also need to know as well make sure you request your exam accommodations by the official deadline. And if you need to know the deadline, you can ask the disability service and they will tell you. And importantly, communicate with any authorities in college directly and not through someone else. 
um, if you know, it's not useful when we have one student saying, oh, my student's in the same course, uh, my friend is in the same course as me, and he asked me to tell you X, Y, Z. Uh, it has to come directly from the student. So really, <clears throat> you need to do your research. You need to be prepared. Uh, do you understand uh, all that's required about accommodation and travel? How you're going to get to college, for example? Do you know what equipment you need? If you're on a science course, uh, do you need things like lab coats, for example? Uh, are you fully up to speed with your digital literacy? So for example, that would be using, you know, things like Microsoft 365. What about information literacy? Are you confident in using the library? Um, generally speaking, there are videos uh, which tell you how to use the library in your institution, but actually you need to take this time to go on a library tour and to use your student card to go in walk around the library and find out how to take books out and to check them back in. You need to make sure you understand your study environment, generally what buildings will you be in when you're um, accessing your course, understand the jargon and know where to get support. What's most important really is that you Think about, and this comes back to self-awareness and self-determination and self-advocacy, what type of student are you? Are you well prepared? Do you know your strengths? Do you know what your needs are? And are you going to be proactive about seeking support for those? Are you still a little uncertain? Are you still discovering what your unique needs might be and what support might be useful? That's why you need to register with support services because they can help you by having that conversation. Hopefully you are not an avoidant student. Uh, every year there are a number of students who don't want to engage with supports and then look for help when things go wrong. And we don't want that to happen because sometimes uh, it's, it's a little bit too late to provide the support that you might need. But the best uh, way of finding out this information or accepting it or taking it on board really is to listen to other students. So we have just completed um, a very large study of ADHD in college. Um, we surveyed all undergraduate, postgraduate students, and we also interviewed some students. So this is the testimony taken directly from what students told us. So in terms of the practical strategies you need, don't give up. The first semester is the hardest because you have to create a routine and coping strategies, but you are smart enough, you need to give yourself time to settle in. Learn how to use a planner, put alarms on your phone, find some time when you can be alone and offline to really focus on working, stick to a routine. Avail of noise cancelling headphones. Seek help and have your diagnosis known. Even maintaining a daily schedule without help and support is difficult. Keep a diary, a journal, and plan schedules. In terms of academic strategies, uh, the advice is to familiarize yourself with, as I said earlier, the syllabus of each module, what am I going to learn? And to make sure you know where all the readings are. Try and stay on top of the workload, uh, ask for help if you need it. Check in with yourself every week. Spend as much time on campus as possible so that you don't miss out on important information and check in with other people on your course. Work on your study skills as much as possible early on. Do not get discouraged by other people's perception of ADHD. It's a valid diagnosis and you deserve the support that you need. Importantly, don't get in the habit of skipping lectures. Uh, as this student said, it's a slippery slope. Start assignments in good time. Cramming might have worked in secondary school, but it takes so much longer to write a college essay and reach out to people for help. In terms of accessing supports, you don't need to do everything per perfectly already. Reach out to get the support that you need contact the disability service and also student learning within your college because they help with academic skills. 
asked for help, I would have left college long ago if it wasn't for the support I received from the disability service. So take advantage. And then in terms of your self-awareness and self-determination, I highly, highly recommend that you develop methods that work for you. Don't look at methods, try and see what you've been doing up till now. You managed to get into college, so you, you must have some good strategies. What has helped and then develop these for you, work on ways to help yourself. Try to link in with other neurodivergent students and half of the college experience is learning how you learn it will take some time. It might be a difficult process, but once you break through and crack this code, everything becomes more straightforward. And make sure that you take care of your mental health and your well-being. Get a good therapist, find a supportive group of people, prioritize your mental stability and attendance. Be patient, realize that not everyone is the same. It's important to make everyone aware that all students learn differently. Exercise regularly, eat well, and this student says drop the use of alcohol or other depressants and strive to maintain some level of routine and accept that a typical college experience might not be achievable or desirable, so lack of sleep or excessive drinking. And just to finish with a comment from a final year student in nanoscience. Living with ADHD, I've come to realize that it's a nuanced condition, often misunderstood and underestimated. While grappling with its invisible barriers, I remain committed to my passion for physics and material science. My journey highlights the urgent need to dispel outdated beliefs and misconceptions about ADHD, ensuring that everyone regardless of their neurological makeup, has an equitable chance at academic success. So that's um, pretty much everything that I had to say to you this evening in terms of my talk. I think we have some questions and some chats. What happens if your on DARE application was accepted? However, the place you have isn't a DARE Will the university still know about their disability? Well, certainly the disability services will know that you're coming to university because you would have been on a dare list. But once you have um, accepted an offer, in many respects, you're not a dare student anymore. Dare is about points and offers. Once you have your place, disability service will be aware of you, but nobody you are not distinguished from any other student as in oh that's a dare student you are entitled to the same support as anybody else and you'll be treated just like anybody else so um you don't need to to worry about that um so those were q and nays what is in the chat uh we actually well, don't have chat alison i'm afraid oh, you don't have chat Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Somewhere along the line in uh, the, the makeup, it wasn't delivered at all. Um, there was no, and I even went back into setting. Unfortunately, we've no chat box. Um, so ah. the, I think we answered an awful lot of questions because I had a list of questions that would have come in from people before the session. And you okay. So I think that's that's the reason behind not many questions here, which is great, um, because you went into a lot of detail. There's a lot of notes to be taken. And just to remind everybody, guys, there is the recording. We will send it out to you. Um, you will have the slides and it is about just putting it in your ears as you're walking down the road and have another listen, listen to it and try and remember the different steps. Make notes then of the few really important places you have to go and You'll, you'll have a great time as soon as you get there and get started, go through your orientation days. <laughs> and are there any other questions that people sent in that you think still need to be answered? No, the DARE no. was one big one because oh. there were not yet. Yeah, there was a lot of people who had accepted offers that were not through the DARE system, which is fantastic because, you know, you don't have to. They, they did it on their own merit again, so it's absolutely brilliant. Um, we have... Oh, Couple of coming in there now very quickly. Okay, um, would you need disability support? I accept non-official diagnosis in order to register. I can't answer that question because you know everybody is every individual's documentation is very specific to them. Um, but that's a conversation that you have with the disability service. 
you know, you should definitely go in, you should definitely contact them and, and take your documentation with you and see what can be done. If you're in college and never had a diagnosis, but now feel overwhelmed and not coping with time management, would you be allowed accommodations? It depends on the college. Uh, sometimes if you access a college counseling service and you're talking to them about some of the difficulties you're having, they might contact the disability service and recommend that you register with them. So again, that's something you need to explore through those support systems that are within the, the college that you attend. So I hope that answers your question, Emma. Thanks, Alison. Um, one thing that uh, we like to say as ADHD Ireland is obviously thank you so much uh, to Dr. Alison Doyle and um, her amazing insight, um, so detailed into the different colleges and into the technologies around it and have this stuff you don't, you don't even think about, um, especially going in, uh, young people going into college for the first time, they're looking around and they're going, yeah, this is great. And they're forgetting where they're really meant to be going. It's not about the buildings yeah. and not about finding a particular room. It's about getting the information, getting your name on the sheets, getting talking to the people that you're meant to be talking to, get that started before the learning has to start. Um, and we are there as ADHD Ireland, just so everybody knows we, we do have, when you're set up, when you're in your lectures, when it is all running smoothly, you're in your flats, you're making your friends, you've got your social life, you've got your work life and your academics are working, you've got your routines and your timetables. Then when you feel overwhelmed, then when you need to talk, then when you feel like you're on your own, we're there. ADHD Ireland, we're doing um, a lot of lunchtime student support sessions online. So when you're walking around campus, you can put on your earbuds, walk around and listen. Into, give your experience, share in the meeting or not at all. Just listen to what other people are going through. Learn from what they're going through. We also are looking for people to work with our advisors program. In every single college, we're going to look for champions. Basically, people who have neurodiverse condition neurodiverse condition ADHD and to uh, be our advocate be the advocate for ADHD um, and maybe work with us on a couple of information days give out leaflets set up social groups we're there to support you and it's just going to be a big part we're trying to be on the ground in the colleges to support um, and you're the, the starting point so do contact us if you have an interest in that but firstly do get yourselves in order with disability services, with your supports, with your accommodation, with your structures and routines, um, as Alison has said. Um, thank you so much. Good um, luck, everybody.